This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the paradoxical eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Uh, today I'd like to um, present you some thoughts about uh, Neanderthal evolution and to what extent uh, climate may have, uh, might have influenced their evolution. But before I, I start with climate and Neanderthals, I wanted to show you this slide um, presenting a, uh, on the left side a Neanderthal and a modern human, about of the same age. Uh, and in front, you have two skulls of um, um, extant um, apes, a bonobo and a common chimpanzee. And this is just to show you how Neanderthals are different from us in terms of anatomy, in terms of phenotype in general. Uh, modern humans and Neanderthals ancestors diverged um, probably about half a million years ago when bonobos and common chimpanzees diverge much uh, earlier, probably somewhere between two and one million years ago. And one of the, I would say, mysteries uh, regarding Neanderthals is what kind of uh, evolutionary processes was driving this very rapid uh, divergence. The way we like to think on the Neanderthals, the way they are presented in the, in the literature, is, is this way. Humans adapted to a glacial environment, a periartic environment. And as a matter of fact, if we have a look on this very jerky uh, climatic curve that you're going to see quite a number of times today, I, I imagine, uh, you can see that for the last half million years, 95% of the time, uh, the, the climate was colder than it is today in the area where Neanderthals live, uh, namely uh, Western Eurasia. This being said, um, the climate was not always glacial. The, the glacial episodes were rather brief, actually. I mean, the most extreme uh, part of these glacial episodes. And if you have a look on, on this map, that's the, the map showing you the distribution of places where Neanderthals has been found, you see that uh, actually they are not documented very, very high in latitude. There is the, the northernmost Neanderthal ever found was found 52 degrees of northern latitude. 
which is not so high. And, uh, and Neanderthals lived also in places like Spain and southern Italy and the Levant um, that never witnessed really glacial episodes. And so the question is uh, what, uh, what in their environment uh, first of all, drove their distribution and also drove their evolution. Their, the distribution that you see now is, is probably, I would say, uh, misleading somehow because it's a palimpsest of the distribution of Neanderthals through a very long period of time. So, in other words, at a given point in the past, they were never, uh, they had never had this extension. So, it's a, a sort of addition of many distribution. And it's very likely that uh, they reach. Uh, this easternmost uh, extension in the southern Siberia, in the Altai, and this is also true for the Near East, for, the, for southwestern Asia, uh, only at some point in their late evolution. So speaking about climate and the influence of climate on evolution, uh, we have quite a number of <coughs> studies showing how climate can influence the, the biology and the morphology of modern humans. And probably one of the most, would say, spectacular uh, feature uh, that relates to uh, climate in, in extant humans is the, the body shape in general. There is a number of studies showing that uh, the proportions of the limb, of the limbs, the shape of the trunk uh, varies with climate. Uh, basically, people exposed to very hot climate need to cool their body. Uh, they tend to be uh, slimmer, uh, to have narrow trunks, long limbs. Uh, people exposed to very cold uh, environments, uh, they tend to be more um, askier, uh, more asky, to have shorter limbs, wider trunks. And um, this kind of, of study, it's a, it's a multivariate study taking into account many uh, population show you how you can basically rank uh, populations from the tropics. On the, on the right side, you have uh, people from East and West Africa up to the higher latitudes. In green, you have European population. So if you take measurements uh, of the, the body shape of a Neanderthal and you plot it in this kind of chart, and this is the case for uh, one Neanderthal very known called La Chapelle aux Saints. It falls beyond any uh, modern European and uh, even beyond modern Inuits. So it's said to, be, uh, to have hyperarctic body proportion. Interestingly, if you plot on the same chart, uh, early modern humans who came into Europe about 50,000 years ago to replace Neanderthals, they plot very close to uh, populations from modern Sudan, uh, which, by the way, it's certainly one of the, one of the best arguments uh, to make them come out of Africa besides genetical arguments. However, we should be uh, very, I would say, cautious with this, uh, these features because Climatic adaptation is not just a biological adaptation in humans, it's also a, a, a cultural adaptation, a technical adaptation. In other words, uh, we suspect that even uh, if Neanderthals were not exposed to always to very cold climate because of the limitation of their technology, the biological response uh, might have been higher than what we have in extant humans. And as a matter of fact, if we look at the archaeological record, we find very few archaeological sites left by Neanderthals in truly periartic environments. It, it looks like during the coldest phases uh, of uh, the glacial episodes, large portions of Europe has been abandoned by the Neanderthals. There are other features that has been said to be uh, related to climate in Neanderthals, especially their very peculiar facial morphology. They have a very strong mesiofacial prognatism, uh, this very uh, big nose uh, projecting. And on the side of the, of the nasal aperture, inside the face, you have these uh, volumes, which are sinuses, which are uh, said to be very developed in Neanderthals in general. And 
in a sort of naive way, people have thought for a long time that the development of uh, sinuses in Neanderthals were a sort of um, isolation against, against corn. This, this idea has been very criticized. It's, it's actually, it's completely abandoned today because we see more these sinuses as a sort of empty space, I would say filling an empty space between other structures uh, that are um, adapting to different functions. It's more interesting to look at, the, at another aspect of the face, which is the nose. And actually, if you look at um, extant humans, you will see that one of the most uh, varying part of the face is the nose and the, the shape of the nasal aperture. Uh, one of these skull comes from Germany and the other one from Zaire in Africa. And immediately you can see that the shape of the nasal aperture is very different in these two uh, individuals. And there is quite a number of uh, studies showing that actually in humans, the, the, the nose, and especially the inner nose, uh, is adapted to the climatic conditions in different uh, regions. Uh, primarily what we have is a problem with cold and dry air. And uh, individuals, population that are exposed to uh, cold and dry environments tend to have uh, nasal cavities that are higher and narrower in order to increase the turbulence of the, of the air that is inspired and to increase the contacts between the mucosal tissues and this air to, to warm it and to, to, to moist it. And uh, the, the, the nasal uh, pharynx is, seems to be more depending on, on moisture. The nasal cavity itself with, with uh, cold. So what's about Neanderthals? Well, at the first look, Neanderthals seems not to match very well this prediction because they have this huge nasal aperture uh, that is somehow unexpected if they were exposed to uh, cold environments. Uh, actually, the, 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 this nasal aperture is especially broad in its upper part, which is not what we find in modern tropical population. But if we look inside the nasal aperture, we see that there are a number of uh, structures uh, that inflate the walls of the nasal aperture in order to narrow this nasal aperture. And uh, although uh, the nasal aperture is, is very broad, uh, outside, uh, the cavity inside is, is much narrower and, and, and much the prediction that we can make of a cold adapted uh, population. Last but not least, we have now a number of information coming from uh, paleogenetical studies, and uh, I'm sure there are much more to come in the future, but we know already that uh, there are a couple of features of Neanderthal that we can relate to the climate, the environment, and uh, I would like at least to mention uh, this uh, gene called MC1R, which is a, a receptor involved in the red air and, and fair completions. And, um, very likely, at least on the Neanderthals on which this uh, gene has been detected, we deal with population with light, uh, light uh, skin uh, color and, um, and, 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 and red air. So we have some adaptation to the uh, cold environment in, uh, in Neanderthals, but the question is, are the other effects of the climate on their evolution? And I would like now to deal with something else that I found probably more important than adaptation itself. One of the questions about Neanderthal evolution is why do we have this divergence between a, uh, an African lineage leading to us and this Eurasian clade about half a million years ago? What happened at this moment? Why, why then, why not before? It raised the question of when exactly we have the last, the first Neanderthals. And the first Neanderthals we have in the fossil record are about 400,000 years. They are found in England. They are found in the, in the UK, in, uh, in, uh, in Spain. And this, this age, a little bit above 400,000, has been sometime in conflict with the dates that were provided by 
by geneticists. And geneticists using a molecular clock based on uh, computations uh, using the, the assumed time of divergence of uh, fossil uh, groups uh, came to much younger ages for the divergence for uh, Neanderthals and modern humans, more something around 300,000 that was a bit problematic for paleontologists. But recently, because it's now easy to, to sequence the complete genome of parents and children, we can compare this genome, and it has been possible to, to find that maybe the, the rate of mutation uh, assumed by this molecular clock was not quite right. And um, new estimates came with a uh, rate of mutation much, much more reduced, about half of what was initially thought. And this new rate of mutation is confirmed by the study of some fossil material. Uh, this is a, a femur of early modern human found in a, in Western Siberia, for which we have the complete genome. We have the dating, it's 45,000 years old, so it's easy to compare the genome of this early modern human with extant Europeans and to have a notion of the rate of mutation along this lineage, and it confirms uh, this uh, reduced rate of mutation that has been recently proposed. So it means that the, the coalescence time for uh, Neanderthals and, and modern humans fits rather well this emergence in the phenotype, in the morphology, around 400 or 450,000. So what's, what has been going on in, in this time period? We have a list of, of um, features proper to Neanderthal that we see emerging through time by a, a, a process of accretion, called accretion, and it's basically a shift in frequency of these features that we see more and more along time. And uh, about 200,000 years ago in the isotopic stage seven, we have basically reached the Neanderthal morphology completely. So the story unfolds between say 450, I'm talking about morphology, huh? and let's say a little bit less than 200,000. It goes at different speed, uh, depending on at different anatomical areas, and we suspect that one of the mechanisms driving this evolution is not adaptation, is not selection, but it's something that geneticists call drift, and this drift is mostly uh, depending on demography. So what is it about? It's simple, you have a variability of a population in terms of genes and in terms of morphological features. And if you reduce the size of this population, if you reduce it dramatically, and, and then re-expand this population, you are going to have, again, a large population, but with a reduced variability, just by chance, just because only some of these features went through this uh, bottleneck. And we have something like that with Neanderthals and along the Neanderthal uh, lineage. I could go through uh, several features, cranial features, facial features. Uh, I just pick up one example, which is what we call non-metrical dental features. And these non-metrical dental features have a, a frequency that uh, increase along the Neanderthal lineage. Uh, we know they are part of the variability of Neanderthals uh, of the middle places in hominids before the Neanderthal emergence, and they seem to be uh, fixed a little bit by chance in the uh, Neanderthals and reach a very high frequency in later form. So what could drive this evolution? We think this jerky uh, curve that you saw uh, several times already, in this period of time, say around uh, 800 to 400,000 become even more jerky. And we have 600,000 years ago, for the first time, the first major glacial episode uh, in Western Eurasia. And we think that this first uh, major glacial episode resulted in, for the first time, an isolation of uh, Western Eurasia and a dramatic reduction of the population living there. And this is confirmed also now by paleogenetics uh, using the uh, high resolution uh, sequencing of Neanderthal uh, and Denisovan genomes. It's possible to make 
assumptions on the evolution of the population size through time of these guys, and we see that contrary to what we have in the ancestors of modern humans, we have around five to 600,000, a dramatic reduction of the uh, population size of this group. So the story unfolds this way. We have in the early Pleistocene uh, Western Eurasian hominins with still a lot of exchanges between Southwest Asia, Africa, Central Asia, Western Eurasia. And with the isotopic stage 16, about 600,000 years, we have probably for the first time this separation time that matched the genetical data. Uh, we have another major bottleneck with isotopic stage 12. And soon after, this is when we have for the first time uh, Neanderthal uh, features emerging in the phenotype of uh, European hominins. And let's say 200,000 years later, after a number of other bottlenecks, we have basically fixed this uh, Neanderthal morphology. So to finish, I would just like to say one word about Neanderthal extinction. And uh, I think I, I hope I convince you that climate played a major role in the, in the rise of the Neanderthals. And the question is, did the climate play a role in the fall of the Neanderthals? And uh, there is a number of uh, theories about that, that Neanderthals got uh, extinct naturally before modern humans moved into Europe. What we think about the uh, emergence of modern humans into Europe is a, a scenario that's a bit more complicated today than it was a few years ago. We think we have two major episodes of colonization of Western Eurasia, one uh, corresponding to what we call the initial upper poetics, sometime around maybe 48,000, and the later one for Western Eurasia around uh, 42 to 43,000. It has been argued that in this time period, the, the climatic curve is especially jerky and that that would have driven the Neanderthals to extinction before or facilitated the replacement by modern humans. Well, I think when you look at this curve, it's very difficult to uh, see, I would say, more jerkiness in this period than before. I think Neanderthals survived all sorts of climatic changes before modern humans arrive in Western Eurasia. And I think the, the main disaster that Neanderthals had to face was not a climatic disaster, it was us. <laughs> Thank you.